be winging his way back from China and couldn't be with us today. Uh, so I would like to welcome you on behalf of the law school. Someone told me once that if you want to get everyone's attention and get things off to a great start, you should begin with a quotation from Abraham Lincoln. So, good afternoon. Uh, without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, Linda Green. I guess before I do that, so I want to make a couple of administrative announcements. One is that in order to give everybody in this room and in the other rooms an equal opportunity to answer any, to ask questions, uh, if there are any, and if there's time after Mr. Lewis finishes his remarks, we've put a card at everyone's place. And if you have a question and you write it down legibly, and then after uh, Mr. Lewis is done, we will arrange to quickly get the cards up here and we will uh, pick a couple that we think are uh, both legible, I, I emphasize this, and interesting, and then he may have time to answer them. And the other thing is that uh, there is a reception to follow, so we invite all of you to join us after that. But without any further ado, I'd like to introduce Linda Green, the uh, she, I'm one of these two. She's an associate vice chancellor for academic affairs. I got confused there for a minute. So Linda and a colleague. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I've been asked to provide a welcome on behalf of the chancellor, John Wiley, and also Provost Peter Spear. So welcome. I am so excited again to welcome Mr. Robert Kastenmeier, uh, who continues to serve this state in many ways, including the support of this lecture series. This is a wonderful event. I also want to welcome Mr. Anthony Lewis, one of the greatest voices on the subject of civil liberties. We have all been enriched by your work, your lifetime of work, and it's a great privilege to share your company and your ideas on this most important subject. Finally, I want to congratulate the law school on its continued support of this lecture. Law schools around the country vary in the relationships that they have with the university. This law school serves as an exemplar uh, in its role not only as a place of excellence in its own right, but also as a vital contributor to the excellence of this university and to our larger community. This 2002 Kastenmeier Lecture is just one example of the continuous wonderful contributions of the law school to this university and to the state and indeed the world. So thank you, thank you for coming and welcome Mr. Lewis, welcome Mr. Kastenmeier. Short. <laughs> thank you very much, Linda. Um, as I think almost everyone here knows, uh, Bob Kastenmeier served this state, this district, uh, in the Congress for 32 years. And during that time, he worked on issues involving intellectual property law and civil liberties and the administration of justice, all topics that I think have become increasingly important. And we're all indebted to the work that he did during his service in Congress. Um, I first met Bob, I think, probably 27 or 28 years ago at a cocktail party at John Stedman's home, and I didn't know very much about his accomplishments as a congressman. I wasn't originally from Wisconsin. I had come from Colorado, but it became very, very clear to me, as I think it's become clear to all the people who've ever brushed up against Bob, that not only is he remarkable because of the leadership that he uh, is capable of and exercised, but he's also one of the most moderate, one of the most modest and considerate people in public life that it's been my pleasure to meet. He's a person 
who's not interested just in what he himself has to say, but very interested in what others have to say. And I think that uh, all the people who've known him over his career would probably join me in appreciating uh, the extent of his modesty and considerateness and compassion. Um, he's been a friend to this school and to the state and to the nation for a very long time, and I'm pleased to introduce Bob, and he will introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, John, for that really wonderful introduction. Um, we're delighted uh, to have this sort of turnout for this particular lecture. This is probably the, the largest turnout we've ever had over the eight, nine, ten years history of this lecture. Uh, I'd like to say that not only are Bill Kaplan and Mike Remington responsible to a large extent in putting this together, but more particularly, uh, Peter Karstensen, Theresa Doherty, and Lynn Thompson. Those three people are one of the three reasons for the great success of this lecture. The second reason is that the timeliness of the subject, the compelling nature of the subject. And the third is the, the great reputation of the speaker we have today, and more about that later. Um, this subject does derive from the work of the subcommittee in part, and however immodest it may be, I, I would like to at least make reference to the past, to 30 years ago, because today it still resonates in terms of what we did or what we failed to do. 30 years ago, we looked at what was Title II of the Internal Security Act. Title II, which I think was, as I now recall, was written about 1946 or so, uh, provided for, it authorized places of detention at various places in this nation, presumed the detention not pursuant to due process, but the detention of Americans, even as Japanese Americans were detained in 1941. And to start off, we had a wonderful coalition of people who were interested in this, not only the classical civil, civil libertarians, but the Japanese American community, Jewish Americans who remember too vividly the, the, the lessons of the Holocaust and how it was possible for a nation to round up innocent individuals to their demise. And also African Americans, because in those days, in the late 60s and 70s, African Americans were actually threatened. That was the time of the Black Panthers and the fear that the, the, the impulse by many that uh, we should round up troublemakers like the Black Panthers put them in a big detention center someplace. So this coalition, together with uh, the goodwill of a lot of other members, was instrumental in, in the repeal itself. Even President Nixon, recognizing the political support that this proposition of repeal had, sent his Assistant Attorney General, Robert Mardian, to us and asked only one thing. The president would sign this, he said, if in the statutory language we preserve the constitutional rights of the, the president as commander in chief. After due deliberation, I refused to put that in the legislation, <coughs> announcing in effect that if a president of the United States were to round up Americans and put them in any such camp, he would not find support in any statute that we would write. 
he would only have the Constitution itself to defend himself in terms of the challenge of that exercise of power. Well, we see that work challenged today. That is the sole point I'm making here, even though civil liberties is a much broader issue. Today we are extremely fortunate, and I will be very brief in introducing uh, our, our honored speaker today. I think many of you already know him, have known him for many, many years. You've read him. You've read his three books, or at least are aware of his books, his, what he's written, Gideon's Trumpet, uh, the Sullivan case, in the press, the fact that he um, early on went to, went to, graduated from Harvard, went to Harvard Law School, and for 15 years has lectured at Harvard on the Constitution and the press. He has become, he regards himself primarily as a journalist. And he, uh, more than any other American, has, has become the speaker to all of us as Americans through newspapers and otherwise, through speeches, through lectures even, as this is, uh, of the importance of our civil liberties, the challenge to them, and what might be done. So I, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to introduce a person who is incidentally, I won't say this in your program, but who is incidentally a very decent human being, <laughs> well liked by everybody. I, I've ever talked to. So it's a great honor to present to you Anthony Lewis. Thanks a lot, Bob. I've got this. Ladies and gentlemen, I think any of you would be pleased by that introduction, and I was. It's a great pleasure for me to be back in Madison, and especially to deliver a lecture named for Bob Kastenmeier. He was one of the truly outstanding members of the House of Representatives who fought for all of us against the constant pressures to shortcut the fair procedures that protect our freedom. I noticed that Representative Kastenmeier and I have something in common. He was a member of the House for 32 years, as you've heard. I was a New York Times columnist for 32 years. I'm not going to press the coincidence too far. <coughs> Newspaper columnists have the illusion that they are changing the world. They're going to change the world. But in their saner moments, they recognize that with rare exceptions, it is only an illusion. Bob Kastenmeier did change the world, the world of American law. In a time of government excesses in such things as the war on crime or the Internal Security Act, which you've just uh, so compellingly heard, he worked to make the government play by the rules. And I have to tell you, sadly, that it made a great difference when he left. <clears throat> Congress quickly passed a law ravaging federal habeas corpus, the writ that enables state prisoners to challenge the lawfulness of their convictions and sentences in federal courts. We missed Bob Kastenmeier, and we still do. Our civil liberties are under challenge today, a profound challenge. It comes from a series of actions by the Bush administration that together assert overweening power in the President of the United States. In the view of President Bush and his lawyers, anyone in this audience could be picked up by federal agents at any time and detained indefinitely in a military prison without charges, without a trial, without access to a lawyer. The detention could continue legally, they say, until Mr. Bush or some other president declares that what he calls the war on terrorism is over. All this can happen if the president simply designates any one of you an enemy combatant. If he does, you are an enemy combatant. You cannot challenge the designation in any court. You cannot speak to a lawyer, your own or one designated, appointed 
to represent you. You just remain in prison, very likely in solitary confinement, until the war on terrorism is declared over years or perhaps decades from now. Now that scenario may strike you as extraordinary, impossible. How could such a thing happen in the United States, a country with a constitution and a bill of rights? But it is happening. The Bush administration has done exactly th that to two American citizens. One is a man named Jose Padilla, a native of Chicago who became a Muslim while serving time in a domestic prison for a domestic offense. He was in Pakistan for some time, then on May 8th of this year flew back to Chicago where he was picked up by federal agents at O'Hare Airport. He was held as a material witness, a device used by the present Department of Justice to hold people incommunicado. He was moved to New York where the department asked a federal judge for a material witness warrant. The judge granted it and appointed a lawyer to represent Padilla. The judge set a hearing for June 11. But on June 9th, President Bush designated Padilla an enemy combatant and he was taken to a military prison in South Carolina. There he remains. On June 10, the day before the scheduled federal court hearing, the Attorney General, John Ashcroft, who, who happened to be visiting Moscow, went on television and announced dramatically that Padilla had been planning to explode a bomb laced with radioactive material, a dirty bomb. We have headed off a terrorist plot, <coughs> the, the Attorney General said. Whether that is actually so, we cannot tell, because there has been no way for Mr. Padilla to contest the dramatic announcement or for the press to test the case against him. We used to think of conviction by announcement as a hallmark of totalitarian countries. A second American citizen is being held in similar conditions after being designated an enemy combatant. He is Yasser Hamdi, who was seized by US forces in Afghanistan and is now confined in a Navy brig in Virginia. The circumstances of his seizure whether he was fighting with the Taliban, for example, or was connected in some way with Al-Qaeda, are not known. Indeed, nothing is known about why Mr. Hamdi was and is being held as an enemy combatant. That information is kept in the bosom of the President and his appointees. In Mr. Hamdi's case, a judge has tried to cut through the veil of secrecy, but so far without success. Federal District Judge Robert Dumar of Virginia appointed a federal public defender, Frank Dunham Jr., to represent Mr. Hamdi. But the Department of Justice objected to Mr. Dunham speaking to him. He might carry out messages from the client to terrorists, it argued. After months of legal back and forth, that remains the situation. A client held in prison without charges and barred from speaking with his lawyer. During one hearing in court, Mr. Du uh, Judge Dumar asked the government lawyers what the basis was for calling Mr. Hamdi an enemy combatant. They produced a two-page statement by a Defense Department employee, Michael H. Mobs, on the characteristics to be found in enemy combatants. Judge Dumar commented, I have no desire to have an enemy combatant get out but due process requires something other than a declaration by someone named Mobs that he should be held incommunicado. Isn't that what we're fighting for? A man who was captured in Afghanistan is not likely to attract our natural sympathy, though we do not know what he was actually doing. But sympathy is not the point. The point is the breadth, the astonishing breadth of the Bush administration's claim of power. It applies to all Americans. It is a claim of sweeping unilateral power to keep anyone in prison indefinitely without effective review by any court. Ladies and gentlemen, I've begun with what I think has been the most menacing attack on our civil liberty since September 11, 2001. But the unilateral, 
indefinite detention of American citizens without charge or counsel is by no means the only repressive measure, measure taken by President Bush since September 11. One of the first was his order in November 2001 directing that non-citizens charged with terrorism or with harboring terrorists be tried by military tribunals. In my view, the order was highly questionable in constitutional terms. It flew in the face of a great and historic decision by the Supreme Court in 1866, ex parte Milligan, which held that there could be no criminal trials by military tribunal, this was after the Civil War, during Reconstruction, of course. No criminal trials by military tribunal while the courts remained open. But in fact, no case has been sent to a military tri tribunal so far, probably because administration lawyers have found it more convenient to detain those they deem to be terrorists without the bother of any kind of trial. Then there are the men more than 500 of them being held at the United States base in Guantanamo, Cuba. Nearly all of them were captured in Afghanistan and are described as fighters for the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. But the Bush administration has rejected the description of prisoners of war. That would entitle them to the protections of the Third Geneva Convention. The convention requires that a hearing be held by a competent tribunal, that's a quote, when the status of someone as a prisoner of war or civilian captive is in question, but the United States has ignored that requirement. The Bush administration has, ins has instead called the detainees unlawful combatants, a newly invented term not found in the Geneva Conventions. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld said that as a matter of policy, if not of law, the Guantanamo detainees would be treated humanely in a way, as he put it, reasonably consistent with the Geneva Conventions. But only, he said, to the extent that the United States found the Convention's rules appropriate, since, quote, technically unlawful combatants do not have any rights under the Geneva Conventions, close quote. To put it politely, the administration has shown a disregard for binding international law in its treatment of the Guantanamo detainees. The Lawyers Committee for Human Rights, in a valuable report on civil liberty since 9-11, pointed out the irony, this hadn't occurred to me, I think it's quite a good point, the irony that the administration says the Guantanamo detainees are combatants, but the law of war does not apply to them because they are criminals. But it says Padilla and Hamdi are criminals but criminal law does, and its protections don't apply to them because they are combatants. The refusal to accept that the Geneva Conventions apply to the Afghanistan prisoners may potentially have a damaging impact on American servicemen and women. If they are captured in a future war, in Iraq for example, the United States would be hard put to object if their captors deny them the protections of the conventions. More deeply, the resistance to the Geneva Conventions, which have been a part of international law for many decades, <clears throat> reflects the Bush administration's dislike of any international legal framework that binds this country. That attitude has been displayed most acutely in the administration's attempt to destroy the newly established International Criminal Court. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld made clear the state of mind underlying the opposition to the court when he said of it, we must be ready to defend our people, our interests, and our way of life. The respected columnist of the London Financial Times, Philip Stevens, remarked wryly that Mr. Rumsfeld's comment was directed not at Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or rogue states developing weapons of mass destruction, but at a UN institution's create, institution created to prosecute those guilty of genocide, war crimes, and acts against humanity. The United States, ladies and gentlemen, used to be known in the world and admired for its defense of human rights in such diverse places as the old Soviet Union and Argentina under the tyranny of the generals. 
Now it is widely seen as an arrogant superpower whose concern for its own sovereignty trumps everything else. Another large area of repressive action is immigration law. Our treatment of aliens was already full of grotesque unfairnesses before September 11. I wrote numerous columns about the cruelties imposed by the Immigration Act of 1996, which called, I should say required, retroactively, the deportation of lawfully admitted aliens for doing things that had not been grounds for de deportation when they were done years before. Some of the cases brought by the Immigration and Naturalization Service under that Act of 1996 beggar belief. Mary Ann Garris was brought to this country from Germany as an infant less than a year old. She lived for 30 years in Georgia and to all appearance, appearances was a Southern American woman, appearances and sounds. But she had never become a citizen. In an argument over a boyfriend, she pulled another woman's hair, was charged and pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor. Years later, the INS sought to deport her on that ground, which had not been a ground when it occurred. She was saved because publicity over her plight embarrassed the INS and the Georgia Board of Pardons and Paroles gave it a way out, gave the agency a way out by pardoning her. To the already arbitrary aspects of immigration law, the Bush administration after September 11 added new burdens. It detained many hundreds of aliens in secret, refusing to disclose their names or places of detention, holding them because they had violated their terms of entry, such as overstaying a student visa, and often holding them for months after their deportability was established and the aliens sought to leave. Others were held as material witnesses. At the direction of the Attorney General, the Chief Immigration Judge issued an order that deportation hearings be held in secret in cases designated by the government as special. Once again, it was the executive branch that was empowered to decide unilaterally which cases fell into that secret category. It was not required to make any showing of the need for secrecy in a particular case. Then there is Operation TIPS, formerly entitled the Terrorism Information and Prevention System which the government described as a national system for concerned workers to report suspicious activity. The idea was, and presumably still is, to recruit Americans whose jobs bring, bring them into contact with lots of people, such as delivery drivers, couriers, telephone repairmen, postal workers, and so on. The goal is to have 11 million of those tipsters reporting on suspicious activity by the rest of us. The idea could have been copied from the Stasi, the secret police of the former East Germany. The Economist, a rather conservative voice and an intensely pro-American one, wrote last month, too many freedoms have been eroded in America since September 11. I think that sentence is a fair summary of what I have tried briefly to sketch, a series of legal actions steadily enlarging that use the terrorist threat as a reason to eliminate what we have regarded as some of our fundamental rights. Now, I have to tell you, if you don't know, and I'm sure most of you do know, that it is not unusual for civil liberties to be crimped in this country in time of war or national emergency. It has happened again and again. Right at the beginning of our history as a nation in 1798, Congress passed a Sedition Act that made it a crime to publish false, malicious criticism of the President of the United States. That was just seven years after the First Amendment was added to the Constitution, providing that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. The country was gripped by fear at the time, fear that the Jacobin revolutionaries of France would export their terror to the United States. We came close to war with France, only the caution and skillful diplomacy of President Adams avoided it. He deserves credit for that, perhaps balancing his great mistake in signing the Sedition Act into law. 
Though the French terror was the stated reason for the act, it was in fact a political statute designed to suppress supporters of Vice President Jefferson in his anticipated campaign against Adams in the election of the year 1800. A number of Jeffersonian newspaper editors and proprietors were tried, convicted, and went to prison. But the first Sedition Act prosecution was of a Jeffersonian member of the House of Representatives, member of Congress, Matthew Lyon of Vermont. He had published a letter to the editor saying that President Adams was engaged in, I quote, a continual grasp for power and an unbounded thirst for ridiculous pomp, foolish adulation, and selfish avarice. That was pretty tame stuff by the slanging standards of the late 18th century, let me tell you. But an indictment charged that Lyon's words were scurrilous, feigned, false, scandalous, seditious, and malicious. He was convicted and sentenced to four months in prison and a fine of $1,000, an enormous sum at the time, and one that Lyon could not pay. He remained in prison until a parade <laughs> of Jeffersonian supporters <clears throat> walked all the way from Virginia to Vermont uh, in protest at his imprisonment, and out of embarrassment, he was released. Jefferson won the election of 1800 in what some scholars have seen as a national referendum on the Sedition Act. In its own terms, the act expired on Inauguration Day, 1801, a blatant sign of its political character. On taking office, Jefferson pardoned all those convicted under the Sedition Act. He explained why in a letter to Abigail Adams. I considered that law to be a nullity, he said, as absolute and palpable as if Congress had ordered us to fall down and worship a golden image. Isn't it wonderful, by the way, that the two of them corresponded despite their political differences? For Mrs. Adams agreed with her husband about the Sedition Act, and she called Jefferson's supporters the French party. In the experience of 1798 to 1800, you can see how this country, for all its commitment to freedom, can react to a perceived threat, a phantom threat in that case, with repression. Soon afterward, nearly everyone repented of the Sedition Act. It, it was wisdom after the fact, a pattern that would be repeated. In World War I, Congress passed another Sedition Act at President Wilson's behest. It prohibited all kinds of speech that might be thought to inhibit government policy. In 1918, Eugene Debs, the great socialist and pacifist who was five times the Socialist Party's candidate for president, made a speech in Canton, Ohio. It was mostly about socialism. But in passing, he expressed sympathy for three men who were in jail nearby for helping others who had refused to register for the draft. They were paying a penalty, penalty he said, for seeking to pave the way to better conditions for all mankind. For his words, he was convicted of violating the Sedition Act and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He ran for president in 1920 from a federal penitentiary. The Debs case heralded years of repressive legal action against radicals of all kinds, both federal and state repression, ladies and gentlemen. There were lots of state laws at that time against all kinds of supposed radicalism. A group of anarchists and socialists who threw leaflets from the tops of buildings in New York criticizing President Wilson's dispatch of troops to Russia after the Bolshevik Revolution were sentenced to 20 years in prison for violating the Sedition Act. That, I think you have to realize, for criticizing a presidential policy. It would be like 20 years in prison for criticizing what President Bush is proposing to do, or says he's proposing to do, in Iraq. And the Supreme Court of the United States upheld conviction after conviction, both state and federal, over the passionate dissents of Justices Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. and Louis D. Brandeis. The Constitution commits us to free trade in ideas, Holmes wrote. It is an experiment, as all life is an experiment. While that experiment is part of our system, I think that we should be eternally vigilant 
against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death. <clears throat> it's hard to read those words for me. I've read them a lot of times to myself and aloud. It's hard to read them without a sense of the extraordinary power of Holmes's rhetoric. It wasn't his only uh, such essay. I'll interrupt myself to give you another example. Forgive me, it really has nothing to do with this, but I just like it so much. <coughs> years later, in about 1930, when Holmes was 89 years old, the case of United States Schwimmer against Schwimmer came before the court. court. Rosika Schwimmer <coughs> had come to this country from Hungary and desired to become a citizen. In those days, uh, a, an applicant for citizenship had to take an oath that he or she would take up arms to defend the Constitution. Uh, Ms. Schwimmer, Schwimmer was a lady of a certain age who was very unlikely to be asked to take up arms. <clears throat> but she wouldn't swear the oath because she was a pacifist, and she was denied the right to become a citizen. And uh, her case went to the Supreme Court, which affirmed the denial of her right to become a citizen with a dissent by Holmes in which he said he didn't agree with her about pacifism and war, though he knew the price of war and he knew it all right. He'd been wounded three times gravely in the Civil War. Uh, he didn't uh, believe in pacifism. But he said at the end, <clears throat> the Quakers have done their part in making this country what it is. And I had not thought hitherto that we regretted our inability to expel them because they believe more than the rest of us in the Sermon on the Mount. That's the last line of the opinion. It's really hair-raising, isn't it? <laughs> we have repented as a nation for the repressive prosecutions of political dissidents during and after World War I. The Supreme Court has adopted the views of Holmes and Brandeis, making speech in this country freer, I believe, than anywhere else in the world. Even political conservatives who favored that earlier repression now advocate freedom of speech. But of course there have been further episodes of repression and repentance. One of them, perhaps most uh, freshest in our minds, or most prominent in our minds, was mentioned by Bob Kastenmeier, and that was President Franklin Roosevelt's detention of Japanese Americans in World War II. We salved our national conscience for that tragedy by eventually paying modest sums to its survivors. Then came the Cold War with the anti-communist excesses that we're familiar with. There were legislative committees hunting subversives and university professors being pressed to take loyalty oaths. There were criminal prosecutions and denials of passports and, and blacklisting of actors and writers and directors. Directors. Most of us, I suppose, have come to regret the excesses of that period, too. Joe McCarthy, the Smith Act prosecutions of communists, the expulsion from the State Department as security risks of the civil servants who best knew Asia, leaving us in official ignorance when the issue of Vietnam came along. To glance hastily at the episodes of repression in our history, as I've just done, is to realize, I hope, that there is something different about the threat to civil liberties today. This time, a claim of executive power to override constitutional rights because of peril to the nation is being made in an undeclared war whose end we cannot predict or even define. That makes the threat to our liberties more profound. And I think it should lead us to examine closely the legal propositions being asserted by the administration. It is those propositions, those claims, that raise the present danger. The Bush administration has not carried out mass arrests of high-profile figures. No Gene Debs is in prison. But under the cover of cases involving obscure, unpopular-sounding persons, the administration is asserting legal arguments that, if sustained, would haunt us for the indefinite future. Something else is different in the current pressure on civil liberty. Attorney General Ashcroft has taken steps that threaten the integrity of the relationship between lawyers and their clients. At least that is the worried view taken by some lawyers. 
a provision of the USA Patriot Act rushed through Congress after September 11 over the negative votes I was reminded at lunch today of uh, Senator Feingold and two Wisconsin members of the House <clears throat> allows the Attorney General to order eavesdropping on lawyer-client con lawyer conversations without the court approval previously required. Then last April, the Justice Department indicted a New York lawyer, Lynn Stewart, on a charge of providing material help to the Egyptian-based terrorist organization known as the Islamic Group. Ms. Stewart represented Sheikh Omar Abdel Rahman at his trial for planning the first attack on the World Trade Center, the 1993 bombing. After his conviction, she continued to act for him, visiting him in the federal prison in Rochester, Minnesota. She signed an agreement with the government not to pass information to or from Sheikh Rahman except for legal purposes. But the government says that at a meeting in May 2000, he dictated to a translator in her presence a statement calling on the Islamic group to end a ceasefire with the Egyptian government and that Ms. Stewart, it charges, confirmed the authenticity of that statement in a later press conference. Whether Lynn Stewart violated her undertaking and violated the law will in due course be decided by a jury. But a number of defense lawyers have taken the indictment as a shot across their bow, a warning from John Ashcroft not to defend alleged terrorists too vigorously. A spokesman for the New York State Bar Association said the case puts the attorney-client privilege in great jeopardy. It has come out also that the government was secretly taping Ms. Stewart's meetings and phone calls for two years before her arrest, and it will not say whether it is listening in now on her meetings with her present defense lawyer, Michael Tiger. I don't have to tell this audience how crucial it is to have independent, unintimidated lawyers at times when people are being targeted as threats to the national security. In the Red Scare of the 1950s, which was when I went to Washington for the first time, lawyers of that character were thin on the ground. Many were wary of representing controversial clients. Of course, some were not scared, and their names will go down in the roster of those who have lived greatly in the law. I think of Joe Rao, Joseph A. Finelli, men who represented alleged security risks and witnesses before the House Committee on Un-American Activities. I think it will be harder to intimidate lawyers today. The country is more rights-oriented now than it was 50 years ago, and so is the legal profession. But it still is troubling to see an Attorney General of the United States treat the right to counsel as dismissively as Mr. Ashcroft has in the Hamdi case and the Padilla case, and to insist that national security requires pervasive intrusion on the privacy of some lawyer-client conversations. The Attorney General has enormous influence on the state of civil liberties in this country. To illustrate that, I want to tell two stories. They're just anecdotal, ladies and gentlemen, uh, but I like them. About the men I think were the greatest occupants of that office in my adult life, Edward Levy and Robert Kennedy. Edward Levy was a careful, conservative, philosophical man, a great teacher at the University of Chicago Law School, its dean and then president of the university uh, before Gerald Ford made him attorney general. Robert Kennedy was a romantic with little experience in the law when he became attorney general, a man who hid his passionate liberal instincts because he thought they might make him look soft. The two men could hardly have been more different but each brought a critical faith to the job. Edward Levy was in his office soon after President Ford appointed him when a private door opened and an official of the FBI entered. It was a rather strange situation. <clears throat> Here he is in this office and there's a small door that nobody ever uses. Suddenly it opens and a man comes in. <clears throat> He identified himself and said he had a wiretap authorization for the Attorney General to sign. Fine, Mr. Levy said, just leave it here. No, the FBI man said, you just have to sign it. Mr. Levy said he would read it first and think about it. Leave it here. 
Robert Kennedy was visited by Telford Taylor, a noted Columbia Law School professor who had been a prosecutor at Columbia, Columbia Law School. I'm sorry, I've done it backwards. A noted Columbia Law School professor who'd been a prosecutor at Nuremberg. He asked Kennedy to urge the president, his brother, to commute the five-year sentence, prison sentence, of Junius Irving Scales. Scales had been prosecuted under the Smith Act for membership, not leadership, but membership in the Communist Party. And his conviction was affirmed by a five to four vote in the Supreme Court. The only person who ever went to prison under the membership clause of the Smith Act. I was covering the Justice Department as a reporter then, and Professor Taylor told me about his quest. The next time I saw Attorney General Kennedy, I asked him about it. He bristled. To commute Scales' sentence, he said, would only anger conservative Democrats in Congress and make it harder to pass the, prog the president's program. That's the trouble with you liberals, he said. You don't understand these things. <clears throat> you have to, experience, have to have experienced Robert Kennedy's bristling to know what bristling could be. <laughs> a month or so later, at a social gathering, Robert Kennedy pulled me aside and said, sort of under his breath, we're going to commute the sentence of your friend Scales. <laughs> My friend. <laughs> he talked a tough game, but he could not forget his instinct for humanity. We are in a different age now, and I suppose I should not be too sentimental about the past. Where we go from here depends very much on the vision and courage of our judges. Will they sustain the radical propositions advanced by President Bush and Attorney General Ashcroft? It is not an easy question to answer. Through much of American history, in times of war and tension, the courts have bent to claims of presidential power. So they did notably in World War II, when the Supreme Court upheld Roosevelt's power to remove the Nisi from the West Coast and detain them in desert camps. The opinion was written by that great civil libertarian, Justice Hugo L. Black. For him, as repeatedly for other judges, it was not for courts to second-guess decisions of the executive on how to win a war. Four years ago, when no war against terrorism seemed on the horizon, Chief Justice Rehnquist published a book about the courts and civil liberties in wartime. After looking over the record, he concluded that judges are reluctant to enforce constitutional guarantees against the government wishes on an issue of national security in wartime. Adam Cohen of the New York Times, writing recently about the Rehnquist book, noted that it hardly mentioned the cruelties suffered by the victims of wartime excesses, the Japanese Americans in World War II, for example. A very different approach has just been taken by the Supreme Court of Israel, a country under constant threat of terrorism. The Defense Ministry ordered family members of three Palestinian suicide bombers deported from the West Bank to the Gaza Strip. They sued to block their removal. The Supreme Court did not give a blank check to the government. It held that family members could be moved to Gaza only if they had personally assisted the suicide bomber. Removal was an extreme and exceptional course, the president of the court, Aharon Barak said. The court permitted the removal of two family members who had helped the bombers, but not of a third, who was aware of his brother's terrorist activities, but did not knowingly assist him. The conservative ma majority on our present Supreme Court may instinctively incline toward giving the president the war-making authority he claims. But the justices will have to consider the reality that this is a new kind of war, as I said earlier, one without a visible end. And they will certainly consider the impact of the Bush claims on their own power. My old colleague, Linda Greenhouse, the Supreme Court reporter of the New York Times, wrote a piece recently that had the headline, The Imperial Presidency Against the Imperial Judiciary. That is what we must not forget. This Supreme Court is one that takes an extremely capacious view of its own power. This is a, a Supreme Court, said former Solicitor General Walter Dellinger, 
that says judges are better able than the PGA to define the essence of golf. <laughs> he was referring Riley to a case decided last year about whether special arrangements had to be made for a disabled golf professional. Mr. Dellinger added, this is a court that decided a presidential election. I would add that the court did so by considering a case in which many, including me, thought it had no jurisdiction. Modesty is not one of its virtues. We may all try to guess where a headstrong Supreme Court will come down on the Bush administration's attempt to brush constitutional rights aside in the war on terrorism. But I think the administration has complicated its legal problem by the breadth and rigidity of its position. For example, the claim that those designated enemy combatants cannot even speak to their lawyers runs up against the constitutional right to counsel in terms written into the Sixth Amendment and just about the rock bottom of due process of law. Judges of the lower, of the lower courts have been showing skeptic, skepticism toward the government arguments. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit found unlawful the order closing all deportation hearings that the government has designated as special. The Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit was initially hostile to an early order by Judge Dumar allowing Yasser Hamdi to speak to his lawyer. But it gave Judge Dumar another crack at the issue, and it is not clear what it will say when the matter comes back up. Federal trial judges, two different ones, have found unlawful the concealment of the names of those detained in the sweep of aliens after September 11 and the use of the material witness law to detain people indefinitely. Ladies and gentlemen, the menace of terrorism is not going to vanish overnight. We have seen how difficult it is for our armed forces, powerful as they are, to root out al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or capture Osama bin Laden. We are going to live with the threat for years, so I think we must have a policy for the long term. That can only be a policy based firmly on law, the law of the Constitution. Law is what has enabled this vast, diverse, disputatious country to survive and prosper. The great law, the great role of law in our society is one of the things that has made us the envy of less happier lands. We give up our reverence for law, for the law of the Constitution, at our peril. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for a really inspiring speech. Um, I'd like the people who've written on cards now to pass them quickly in, and then they can be brought up to my colleague and I, Frank Turkheimer. Frank has a question for you, uh, which is, could you comment on the terminology, the Constitution is not a suicide pact? <laughs> um, well, we had a whole piece about that in the New York Times the other day. <laughs> And I, don't ha I didn't memorize it, but <clears throat> uh, we had an editorial first that, uh, I say we, I was with the paper for 50 years, so it still feels like we, though I've retired. The <laughs> um, paper had an editorial attributing the phrase, the Constitution is not a su suicide pact, to Justice Goldberg. And I sent an email message to the author congratulating him, but saying, uh, you know, I think it was Justice Jackson who said that. <laughs> well, it was Justice Jackson who first referred, he didn't say the actual sentence, the Constitution is not a suicide pact, but he used the image of not a suicide pact in a sentence, and then later uh, Justice Goldberg used it. Um, well, I suppose it's a way of justifying uh, the bending of the Constitution in times of stress or war, uh, the very thing that I was talking about. One of the questions here is, the Geneva Convention 
contemplate a different kind of war than the one that resulted in 9-11. And doesn't that permit the president to set up new rules to do with, deal with a new kind of war? Uh, well, you know, I think uh, when you sign a treaty, which we did, and the world complies with it for a period of near, nearly a century, uh, you can't unilaterally modify it. If it needs modification for a new kind of war, there should be a further treaty-making process. In any case, I don't understand what the problem is. Why can't we recognize them as prisoners of war or uh, call a competent tribunal, that's the language of the convention, to decide whether they are prisoners of war? If they are not, and because of the changed nature of the war, then the competent tribunal will find otherwise. It, the essence of the convention, which surely would not change in any new treaty, is that uh, things are not to be unilaterally judged. That's the point of an international agreement on how to, tr how to deal with prisoners of war. If you can change it unilaterally, wh why have the convention in the first place? That's my view. Has the ABA spoken out against President Bush's actions? And I can kind of amend, add to the question, are you satisfied with the way the bar, as a general matter, has responded to what the President has, has done and proposed? You know, I'm actually not familiar uh, in detail with what the American Bar Association has done. Uh, but in general, uh, yes, I think the bar is slowly, gradually, but deliberately coming forward on various of these issues. Um, and it's a, it's a great contrast to, say, 50 years ago, the Red Scare period of the 50s, uh, when the bar was very slow. The American Bar Association was a very conservative organization then, um, very reluctant even to criticize racial segregation. Um, and uh, it had a, a committee on uh, um, Dangers, the dangers, I've forgotten what it was, but it was a sort of anti-communist committee. Um, the, the Conference of Chief Justices, which is a body that um, is composed of the Chief Justices of the 50 states, adopted a resolution criticizing Supreme Court decisions in, <coughs> in the free speech area that coincidentally may have done something, not much, something, but I repeat, not much for people accused of communist associations. The Supreme Court wasn't particularly brave. I'll never forget, this is a, it's one of my wandering comments here, but <coughs> not responsive to the question, but I'll never forget Professor Paul Freund of the Harvard Law School, who uh, described the report of the Conference of Chief Justices as an attack, no, he said, this is an instance of the Chief Justices sitting in review of the performance of their reviewer. <laughs> in a very different vein, how did you have to add, Maybe I should add there, just for a sort of plug for the home team. <laughs> My wife is now a member of that conference. No such thing could happen. <laughs> In a very different vein, how did you happen to get involved with Gideon and write the book? Well, that's just a home, homely story. Uh, I was covering the Supreme Court then. This was 1963. Um, and in those days, this will make me really seem antique, there were no copying machines at the Supreme Court. <laughs> and while um, ordinary petitions for review, petitions for certiorari, had to be submitted in 40 copies, printed copies. Uh, those too poor to supply printed copies could, could file informer pauperous petitions, and that included primarily, not exclusively, but primarily prisoners. Gideon's was a handwritten letter written in pencil on blind prison stationery from the Florida Pen Penitentiary in Rayford, Florida. We, that is the, the few of us in those days, really a handful, of people who covered the Supreme Court didn't get to see the prisoners' petitions, the informer pe pauperous petitions, because there was only one pop copy. And it was in a maroon-colored sort of uh, cardboard jacket that was circulated among the nine justices. And until they passed on the petition for review by a prisoner, it couldn't be seen. And when the day came when the Supreme Court 
announced whether it would re review prisoners' petitions. There was a long list, and it said informa pauperis petitions, and they were almost all denied. And if they were denied, well, I suppose I could have gone and read them all, but I didn't. But if they were granted, then it was potential news. So Gideon's petition was granted. I therefore went to the file room of the Supreme Court in the basement and said, could I see this petition? And they brought it out, and it was this handwritten letter from Gideon. And the Supreme Court that day had said, the petition is granted. Counsel are instructed to argue whether this court's decision in Betts against Brady should now be overruled. Well, you know, that sounded like a good story. It was pretty clear that the Supreme Court was going to overrule Betts and Brady, which if you don't know the case, Betts and Brady was the case in which the Supreme Court had said that a poor person charged with crime was not automatically entitled to uh, counsel supplied by the state. He was entitled to counsel only if he or she could show that he was a victim of particularly adverse circumstances. Uh, he was overborne by uh, ignorance or uh, mental debilitude or some other thing. And the Supreme Court had wrestled for 20 years with trying to define who came within that elastic definition of who was entitled to free, free counsel as a defendant and uh, had been notably unsuccessful in doing so. And now it was clear that they were going to change their minds from the way the order came down. It, it happened, I'm going on too long, but it happened that someone had asked me to write a children's book about the Supreme Court, and I said, oh, okay, I'll do it. <coughs> and when I saw this petition, I said, oh, that'll make a good chapter for my children's book. Well, <laughs> turned out to be a whole book. Uh, you know, Abe Fortas was appointed to uh, represent Gideon so that having had no lawyer when he was convicted of a minor crime in Florida, he now had one of the best lawyers in the country <laughs> uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States. Maybe the premier arguer of his time, brilliant arguer, Abe Fortas. Um, and uh, all the odds for him instead of against him. And so I, I followed the case in the Fortas firm. I went to Rayford to talk to uh, Gideon and so on and so on and it made a book. Long answer, sorry. Uh, this question asks you to, to, it agrees with everything you're saying, but ask you why. Why do so many of us need to learn and relearn these lessons in every generation? We look back on these events with horror and regret, yet with each new threat and challenge, it all goes out the window, and we, the public and Congress, defer to the claims of the executive. What's wrong with us? <laughs> Well, first of all, the United States uh, suffers from the same thing that journalists do, short attention span. Uh, it's a professional uh, deficiency, and it is an American habit. We're not a historical country. Uh, any of you who's, and you've all, I suppose, been to Europe or Asia, where history hangs heavy. It's not a, it's not a one-sided thing. If you go to a place like Yugoslavia and you, <laughs> you discover that the Serbs are still <coughs> fighting the Battle of Kosovo in 1389, and you think that maybe it's good to get over history at some point. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's what Judge, when Judge Goldstone, a South African judge, was appointed the prosecutor of the War Crimes Tribunal on the former Yugoslavia, and he went there to talk to people. He, he, he complained that everybody, every conversation he had with anybody began in 1389. <laughs> um, so forgetting has its uses, uh, or not paying attention to history, and this country is really ahistorical. But uh, I don't know, it's just in, I think, not just American, but it's in the nature of most people to forget. Um, and to be moved by the urgencies of the particular moment. Each moment as it comes along seems terrifying, whether it's the French Jacobin threat in 1798 or the threat of syndicalists in 1924 when <coughs> Anita Whitney, a, a California lady, was sent to prison for uh, being a syndicalist. I mean, it's laughable to think of it today that somebody could be sent to prison for being a syndicalist, whatever that is. <coughs> she provided a great service for, by uh, giving uh, Justice Brandeis say, an occasion to write probably the greatest uh, statement on freedom of speech in 
I have to say, maybe, certainly in American history, maybe in all of history, I might be a close call with John Stuart Mill, but uh, that was one of the few quotes I didn't read, uh, and I, won't, I don't have it before me, so I won't. But anyway, we forget. Each of these episodes comes and we forget. Why do we forget? As I say, I think it's just in the nature of people to wipe the slate clean and not to keep uh, reliving it. And it's only a few people who tell you, the civil libertarians, the ACLU, uh, lawyers, more and more lawyers, and I credit them greatly for that, to warn us, we're doing it again. Would you comment on racial profiling and whether you think it's justified under the circumstances? That's a really tough question, ladies and gentlemen. It sounds like a softball over the plate. I'm against racial profiling. Well, of course, as such, I'm against racial profiling. Uh, I don't believe that all of anybody is bad. Not all Bosnians, not, not all blacks, not all whites, not all Muslims, not all anybody. Uh, it hardly, you know, it hardly needs to be said. But <clears throat> the fact is that without some more sophisticated analysis, the security measures that we take, for example, at airports are really nonsense. Uh, I think probably those of us who fly have seen what I mentioned to Heinz Klug I saw yesterday when I flew here from Boston. I'm at the airport in Boston, <coughs> and a very elderly woman with a cane is being put through this intense scrutiny, scanned up and down, <coughs> her bag emptied all over the table. It's ridiculous, ladies and gentlemen. It is a waste of time immense amounts of money and very bad for our security. You can't get security that way. The only way you can get it is the way Israel does it at its airport, the Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv. And that's unpleasant, but it's the only way you can really get security. They've never had a terrorist incident on an Israeli plane or any plane leaving that airport since they started that security system many years ago. And what is it? They closely interview each person, just for a few moments, to see where the person has been, what sort of person it is, and whether that person falls into a category uh, of someone who, we might say, is in the profile. It's not racial profiling exactly, but it might be, it might be a racial element, in it. it might be an element of where you've been, your history, and they concentrate on those few people, and they don't have any terrorist incidents. Now that's sophisticated, it's difficult, but you're not going to have perfect security by interviewing in every single person who goes through an airport and haphazardly, because it is haphazard, taking every seventh person, even though the seventh person chosen may be among the, the least likely one-tenth of one percent to be carrying a bomb. Indeed, ridiculously unlikely. That's not going to work. So it's not such a straightforward answer. What is the most effective action a person can, can do to help turn around the erosion of our civil liberties? Well, I'd say one of the good things you could do would be to elect Bob Kastenmeier. <laughs> <coughs> or his... Uh, <laughs> that's where it matters, ladies and gentlemen. You know, that's where it happens. You have a few courageous people in Congress uh, few courageous lawyers, they begin to make a noise, and sooner or later, the rest of us get ashamed and we pull back from our excesses. I think that's been the pattern, and I think it's going to remain the pattern. You have to speak up, and the best way of speaking up is through your vote. It's not the only way. You also write letters, you bring lawsuits, you know, you express yourself. That's what we can do in this country, and it's hard going, it's slow, it's frustrating, but it does work, eventually. I'm I'm an optimist about that, or I guess I wouldn't be here. Uh, thank you very much again. I have two or th three short things. One is, it uh, be very helpful if Jennifer Racine, if she's here, could check with the uh, organizers, Professor Carstensen or myself, after the program. Secondly, um, remember the reception, but you won't be able to avoid it because I think you'll have to go through <laughs> it on your way out. And finally, I've been on the faculty for 30 years, and I've been waiting to do this. <laughs> um, uh, most uh -oh. of you know what's in here. 
And when we have a special friend, we give them one of these. And they have to figure out what to do with it. <laughs> this is the gargoyle, or a small version of it. This is, uh, the large version of this is all that's left of the old and venerable law school that stood on this spot before it was torn down. So we present this to you. Now the good news is, <laughs> the good it's news heavy. is that he's going to give it back to us and we will arrange to have it shipped to you so that you don't Ray. need to uh, <laughs> take it through airport security. But it's wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. And uh, thank all of you. I see many, many good friends and familiar faces out there. Let's I'll, I'll have now some more fellowship and I'm sure discussion of many of the things that you've provoked us with. Thank you. Thank you.